why all is done. And just for those who understand, share, right? You see that there are two angles of looking at this. He had two parts to his mission. One was La Ila, the other one was Illa. There are some who understood when he did his La Ila, meaning he rejected the Bayat of Yazid. There are some who understood that. And there are some who understood Illa. Someone who understood La Ila and those of you who know Sheikh would know this really well. There are those who understood Imam Hussain's first mission which was La Ila and then there are those who understood his second message which was Illa. La Ila was established by Imam Hussain then Illa was established. The one who understood La Ila was Haja Amir. Mohibdi Chishti. He says, Shah Hasto Hussain, Bacha Hasto Hussain, Deen Hasto Hussain, Deen Bana Hasto Hussain, Sardar, Nada, Dasdar, Dasda Yazid, Hakka Ke Bina E, La Ila Hasto Hussain. He said, Imam Hussain is the king. Imam Hussain is the real Shah. He is the real leader. Why? Because he gave his head. But he did not give his hands in the hands of Yazid. And that's why he became the foundation of what? La Ilah. He became the foundation of La Ilah, not Illallah. La Ilah. Because La Ilah meant that you must reject the bayat of Yazid. And by doing that, he established La Ilah. And the one who understood Illallah was Allah Ma'ibah. Who said, Naksha illallah bar sahra nevesh. That he wrote down illallah on the desert of Karbala. You see that? Someone understood what la ilah is, someone understood what illallah is. And if you put both of them together, it becomes Sirat Mustaqeen. So, first, my brothers, in order to reach Allah, you must do la ilah. And in order to do la ilah, you must reject shaitan. If you don't know who shaitan is, if you don't know how he is tricking you, if you don't know his plans, if you don't know his plots, then he's already misguided you. He's already misguided you. You think that, you know, you're practicing Islam? He's already got you. Why? Because you don't even know where he's coming from. So, what we are doing here in these two weeks is to learn about shaitan. That is the subject, that is what we are discussing. So now with this in mind, let me just go into the topic. The first thing, really, shaitan is the source of misguidance. We all agree with that. The source of misguidance, he, his job is to misguide you and that's what he does. He takes you away from Allah's path. He has been the source of misguidance since the beginning of mankind. And he will be there until the end of mankind. So the question first when it comes to shaitan is this. That if this guy is so bad, if this guy is so horrible, then why did Allah create him? Why did Allah make shaitan when he knew that he's going to be this bad and he's going to misguide so many people? Why did Allah create him? That's the first question. That must be answered when it comes to shaitan. That's the first question that must be answered. Why did Allah create shaitan? My friends, this is what we first of all need to understand. And the answer to that is very simple, my friends. Answer to that is very simple. Allah did not create shaitan. Allah did not create shaitan. Right? Understand that? Right? Allah did not make shaitan. You know, we need to understand. Do not blame Allah for that. Right? Allah didn't make shaitan. Allah created a jinn who became shaitan. Said that Allah created a jinn. Shaitan is a jinn. We are insan. Shaitan is a jinn. Allah created insan and jinn for what? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسِ إِلَّا لَيَعْبُدُونَ I have created insan and jinn so that they may worship me for my obedience. So jinn were made for Allah's obedience just like you were made for Allah's obedience. 
You were also made for Allah's obedience. Jinn were made for Allah's obedience. Allah made them to obey Allah, to serve Allah, to worship Allah. But if this guy went bad, if this guy went astray, then he became shaitan. Allah didn't make him shaitan. See, if we go bad, then Allah's purpose in our making was not, you know, that okay, he becomes a bad person. He wanted us to be more men. He wanted us to be a believer, to worship him. Now, I want to make that clear. Let me give you an example so you understand. Salawat ala You know, uh, let me tell you that, you know, for example, how many kids there are in this room? Don't count, don't worry about the count. Right? Right, you have kids. Now you see there are some kids who are good and they pay attention. Right? And there are some other kids, you know, who, for example, are on their own. Right? They do things. Now let's say, you know, there's one kid who's a brat. Who doesn't listen to anyone, not even his dad. You know, he doesn't listen to anyone, not even his dad. So everyone looks at him and says, Shaitan. <laughs> This is the shaitan, right? <laughs> they blame him the shaitan, right? The dad, he, you know, he, he also, here's this kid who doesn't listen to his dad, doesn't listen to anyone, he makes noise all the time, he makes problems all the time, and everyone is thinking shaituni, he's crazy, you know? <laughs> this is real shaitan. So now what happened is that, if you go to his dad and say, hey, listen, buddy, you know, brother, this and that, I love you, all this, this and that, but why did you give birth to Shaitan? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? He said, kid is a Shaitan, right? He said, yes. Why did you give birth to a Shaitan? He said, listen, <laughs> my intention was not to bring out a Shaitan. <laughs> my intention was to bring out a good Muslim, a moment, decent person, this and that. What can I do? He became Shaitan. You see, just like you cannot blame a father for his child going bad and becoming shaitan, you cannot blame Allah for a jinn going bad and becoming shaitan. Allah. Allah made a jinn to worship him. That jinn became bad. He went bad and went astray. That's his problem. He's gone bad. So, but you have to realize that Allah did not make him shaitan. He became shaitan himself. Okay, so that answers the first question, but then you can say, well, Allah, you know, okay, he became bad. You knew he became bad, and he did these things. Allah, you gave him life. Why didn't you just kill him? You know, I mean, if you knew that this guy is bad, he's going to make people go astray, why don't you kill him? Death is in your hand, you gave him life, and for you, it's not hard. You don't need a gun, you just say, kun. You know, you just say kun for your kun, you know, he'll be gone. But you don't need a gun, you know, you don't need anything to kill him. You just need to say, be and he's dead. You could have done that a long time ago, that would have saved so much headaches. You see, my friends, this is a real question. Why did Allah let shaitan live? Why did Allah let shaitan live? That is the main question we need to ask. And that I want you and you to understand today, my friends. Because you see, shaitan's existence is not only good, is not only beneficial, but it's also necessary. His existence is necessary. Not only is it good, not only is it beneficial for us, for Islam, but it is necessary for Islam. And this is what I want you to understand today. I will mention some of the benefits today and some tomorrow. Why is shaitan alive? Why does Allah keep him alive? And then you will understand that there are many things in the ideology of Islam. There are many things in Islam which would never be understood if it wasn't for shaitan. It's only because of shaitan we can understand it, we can comprehend it, and no one can argue against it because of shaitan. And now let me tell you those uh, reasons and the things why shaitan's 
existence is beneficial for Islam. Send me a You know, the first benefit of shaitan. Why is shaitan alive? The first benefit. I'll tell you five of them today. Why? Five benefits. You see, when shaitan came, he came to misguide people from Allah's path away from Allah's path. So in order to guide the people to Allah's path, Allah sent prophets, Anbiya. They came to guide the people to, uh, to Allah's path. So shaitan is pulling you away from Allah's path. Prophets are pulling you towards Allah's path. So there's a tug of war here. On one hand, there's shaitan. On the other hand, you have the prophets, the imams. The prophets are trying to teach you Allah. Shaitan is trying to teach you something other than Allah. He's trying to pull you away. Prophets are trying to pull you there. Now, in that tug of war, both of these groups, shaitan and the anbiya, they give their own arguments. Shaitan gives his arguments. Ambiya get their arguments to make the people realize who's right. For example, Ambiya might say about Allah and about his attributes and this and that. Shaitan will have his arguments. And both of them they give arguments. Now it's up to us to decide who we want to follow. Right? Shaitan or Prophet. Who do we want to follow? So it's up to us to decide. Now in all these arguments, there's one argument that shaitan has that the Ambiya and the prophets do not have an answer to. They don't have an answer to that. There's one argument that shaitan has. Really, that all the Ambiya, except for in our ideology, in our belief, Prophet Muhammad. You know, either you accept it or you reject it. And that question and that point that Shaitan has is this. He said, listen, no matter what these prophets tell you, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. I mean, who are you going to trust more, them or me? Because I have something that they don't have. I have a one off and a point that makes me better than them. And what is that? I'm older than they are. <laughs> I mean, your father, Adam, was created in front of me. If these prophets are calling you towards Allah, remember, I saw them in diapers. <laughs> I saw them in diapers. They were born in front of me. Who? You would listen to them or me? I'm the elder. Right? I'm the older. You know, I'm older than they are. So who are you going to listen to? Them or me? You know, so now we have to decide. You know, he's right. You know, he is older. By thousands of years. He is older. So are we going to respect his age and say that no, whatever he says is right? Or are we going to reject that? And say that no. Right? The Ambiya are right. Understand this. What are we going to do? Is there any Muslim who says that no, we should listen to Shaitan because he's older than everyone else? Is there anyone who says that? Everyone will say no, of course not. We will never listen to Shaitan. So if you don't listen to Shaitan, even though he's older than everyone else, then what it means is that truth and heart has nothing to do with someone being older or someone being younger. If you come forward and say, accept me because I'm older, then first we must accept shaitan. If we use that argument, then first we should use that argument with shaitan. Oh, he's older, so we should accept him. While shaitan is older than everyone else. You see, 
Shaitan is older than your time. So the first thing Shaitan's existence has taught us that age has nothing to do with the truth. You just have to go to shaitan and say, listen, if you say that, then let's accept shaitan first. Would you accept it? No, okay. If you don't accept it there, then don't accept it here also. But we see, a lot of times we do follow shaitan's ideology. We do follow shaitan's ideology. You, know, you will see that. See, to us, it doesn't matter who is speaking the truth. If he's older, we will accept it from him. If he's a kid, we will accept it from him. If even if it's from a kid, we'll say he's saying what he's saying is right. Accept that. But you see, many many people don't have that idea. They follow the ideology of shaitan. Look at them, they do what? Shaitan wants them to do. You know, like for example, you know, you'll see them talking with the kids. And if the kid says something right, he says something right, then you know it's right. They shut up. I'm your elder. You don't speak in front of your elders. Bro, I'm saying it's right. No, shut up. Don't you see? I have a white, white beard. I have white hair. I don't have any white hair for nothing. <laughs> Where, which ayat and which hadith is it written that you must have white hair to be listened to? Wow. This is a problem also. When we choose our ulama also, you see, you will have more respect for those who have a wider beard and no teeth. <laughs> you say he's really a mullah if he doesn't have no teeth. <laughs> Since when did that become the sign of anything? You know, when did that become the sign of anything? You know, in that case, then truly we would not accept Ali as the Khalifa. Why? He's only 33 years old. That's the argument that was made, right? He's too young. He's too young. The other guy is very elegant, you know. <laughs> you know, he has the nice soft white beard. I <laughs> think we should accept the white beard. <laughs> if, if you are accepting him because he's older, then accept Shaitan also. He's older than all the MBA. Accept him. So if you are saying no there, then say no here also. Because Haq has nothing to do with age. Haq is what Allah has revealed to us. That is what Haq is. I mean, being older has nothing to do with the truth. Right? Truth is accepted from anyone. Even if it comes in a cradle, you will accept it there. Even if it comes in a baby, you will accept it there. That's why when Allah sent Isa, He sent him as a baby. And accept the truth there. You know, accept the truth there. Even as a baby, accept it there. Right? Salawat ala So this is the first thing. The second thing, my friends, we learn from shaitan's existence. Right? The second benefit of shaitan. You know, everyone really has a time that they live and we all die. Right? We all die. Right? Some of us live for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. There's no time limit on death. It can come any minute. You know? I mean, you know, you can die as a youngster. You can die working out. You know, I had one brother who died three weeks ago and he used to work out three hours a day. Right? And he died in the gym working out on the treadmill. You know, and no one would have thought that he would die. You know, when Allah wants to take you, He can take you whether you are in bed. Whether you're in the hospital or whether you're on your treadmill, you'll take him everywhere. Right? Everywhere you see, you will see that Allah can take you. But everyone has to die, we know that. We will know that everyone has to die. One day or the other, they're going to die. Now, since shaitan is misguided, 
I've seen Shaitan is misguiding us. Now understand this, my friends. If Shaitan is misguiding us, if he comes to someone and he misguides us, what do we say? Say that, oh, that Shaitan, he got me again. Okay? Who got you again? Shaitan, he got me. Shaitan got me again. And you wonder like, Shaitan got you again? How can Shaitan get you? You know, how can Shaitan get you? Yeah, he got me. But, do you know what you're saying? I said, yes. It's Shaitan, he misguided me. I said, but Shaitan, you know what that means? He's alive for? Come So now, if you all can pay attention here, inshallah, that will be good, alright? When you look at this, right, and you see, right, how he comes to you, and you ask him, Shaitan misguided you? He said, yes, Shaitan misguided me. He said, but wait a minute, do you know what that means? It means that, how long is Shaitan alive for? I mean, he lived 6,000 years before Allah. From Adam till now, how many thousand years is this? Are you trying to say Shaitan is alive for like 20,000 years? Do you accept that? As a Muslim, do you accept that? Everyone shall die. And everyone is dying. Do God alive for 1,000 years and he's dead. You are saying Shaitan is alive for how many years? That much? Shaitan is alive for that many years? Do you accept that? Is there any Muslim who said no, he's dead? Anyone thinks he's dead? Raise your hands. Right? If you think he's dead, raise your hand. You know? <laughs> he's still alive, right? We all believe he's alive. Right? Shaitan is alive. Everyone believes that he's alive. If you are a Muslim, you believe he's alive. So all Muslims believe that. Shaitan has been alive for how many years? Thousands of years. No one rejects it. And Allah has kept him alive. Okay. And why did he keep him alive for? Why did Allah keep Shaitan alive for 20,000 years? For what? Why did he keep him alive for? He says he kept him alive for misguiding the people. I mean, Shaitan is misguiding the people. My friends, pay attention. He's been misguiding the people for thousands of years. He has been kept alive for thousands of years to misguide the people. So if Shaitan, if I say, okay, you believe in that. Everyone believes in that. If you are a Muslim, you will believe in that. Then if you believe in that, then, then understand this. If you believe that shaitan is alive for thousands of years to misguide the people, to misguide the people, Allah has kept them alive for thousands of years, then you shouldn't have any problem. If I say that shaitan has kept alive my imam for 1200 years to guide the people. You see, if I'm saying Imam Mahdi has been alive for 1200 years to guide the people, you say, oh, how can that be? Well, then first you must reject Shaitan's life. Shaitan has been alive for more than that to misguide the people. So if Allah can keep alive someone thousands of years to misguide the people, then why can't He keep someone alive for 1200 years to guide the people? 
Shaitan's lying to the best proof of that. If you accept Shaitan, then you shouldn't have any problem accepting the life of Muhammad. You shouldn't have any problem with that. You accept the Shaitan's life. And if you reject Imam Mahdi's life, then first reject Shaitan's life. First reject it there, then you can reject it here. But if you accept it there, then there's no problem in accepting it here. You see, the second benefit of Shaitan's existence. He is the one who has, you know, it's easy for us to argue now with this. The third point, and I'll go through this a little bit faster so we can uh, reach a conclusion. The third point, the third benefit of Shaitan's existence is what? You know, here comes Shaitan, he misguides someone. And you say, ah, Shaitan misguided me. And I look at you and say, what do you mean Shaitan misguided me? He says, yes, you know, I mean, I was thinking that Shaitan who put that in mind. He said, where? I don't see him. Did you see him? Yeah, he, what, was he here? Yeah, yes, he was here and he misguided me. He said, did you see him misguided? No, I didn't see him too. Are you sure? He says, yes, he misguided me. But you didn't see him. He said, yes. Did anyone see Shaitan misguide you? We all have been misguided one time or another. Did any one of you see Shaitan come to you and pull your hand and say, Hey, listen, you know what? I'm misguiding you. Did anyone see Shaitan misguide you? No. Why not? Why didn't you see him misguide you? Because he's been kept hidden. Hidden. Yeah, you can't see him. You can't see him. And he still misguides you. Yes. So you believe that shaitan is hidden from you and he still can misguide you. Do you accept that? The yes. Does any Muslim reject that? No. Every Muslim accepts the fact that shaitan is hidden from your side and he still can misguide you. Well, if you accept that, then what is your problem? If we believe that our Imam is Khayyad, that you cannot see him but he's still guiding you. Wow. 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 Do you see that? We don't have to go to ayat and hadith to prove that the Imam is ghayab and there could be something as ghayab. Shaitan's ghaybat is the first ghaybat before the Imam is The concept that Shaitan cannot be seen and misguides you is the same concept that the Imam cannot be seen and still guide you. You know, and still can guide you. Imam's ghaybat is proven through shaitan. That is the, that is the benefit of shaitan. Now the fourth point. I'm going through this, right, just to make you all understand these things. Why? Why Allah kept shaitan alive? What do we learn from shaitan? Now my friends tell me. Uh, if there was an election today, right, if there was an election today, and uh, on the ballot were Allah and Shaitan, who do you think would win? Allah. You see, we already have opinions here, but we need the truth. Who do you think will win? Do you think Allah will win or Shaitan will win? I mean, you don't have to, I mean, you don't have to go here and there. Allah has admitted defeat in the Quran. Allah has admitted defeat in the Quran. He himself has said who will win. He said, Aktarahum la yominun. Most people do not believe. Most people do not understand. Very few will believe. Allah himself has admitted, accepted the fact that I have few followers. Shaitan has more followers. Allah has already said that. You don't have to say it. He is as a, as one of the people on the ballot. You know, as the, as the presidential candidate, he has already accepted defeat. He said, I have lost, he won. He has more followers, I have less followers. Allah Himself has said in the Quran, you don't have to go and do a head count or take vote. Shaitan has more followers, Allah has less followers. My friend, understand this. Allah has less followers, Shaitan has more followers. And almost 
So now, if I tell the Muslims, hey listen, Shaitan has more followers, should we follow him now? Do you, would you accept this fact that because Shaitan has more followers, you can follow him now? Then no, no, we can't follow Shaitan. Even though he has more followers. Yes, even though he has more followers. So what does that mean? What that means is that truth has nothing to do with who has more followers or who has less followers. You see, truth has, hak has nothing to do with who has more followers or who has less followers. If you are telling me that you should become one of us because we are more than you, then first become the follower of Shaitan because he is more than Allah's followers. Salawat ala Muhammad wa If he wasn't alive, we wouldn't know it. We would have to go to the Hadith and Ayat and start proving it from there. You know? To us, Shaitan is proving the fact that, listen, if you are the majority in hand, it means what when it comes to truth? It means nothing. Zip. Nilch. Truth is what Allah has revealed, not if you more people follow it. You know, truth has nothing to do with followers. Truth is that which is revealed by Allah. That which is Allah, that is the truth. Right? Even if there are few people, and Allah has already admitted there will always be few people on the truth. There will always be a few number. Most of them will not never will never believe. They'll never believe that. And hence, this is proven by Shaitan's existence. This is the fourth point, my friends. Understand Shaitan. There's one more point today, inshallah will end the speech. One more point, I'll make it fast so we go through this. You know, and because it's the weekend, you know, we told to take a little bit more time, so I'm stretching it a bit so that we can uh, take advantage of the weekend and not have it work tomorrow. Salawat ala Muhammad. This shaitan, right? This shaitan, he prayed to Allah 6,000 years. Allah told all the dwellers of heaven, prostrate before Adam. They all prostrated before Adam except for Shaitan. Shaitan asked to leave, you know, get out. Just get out, you know. So, you know, he turns around and says, Ya Allah, what, you know, that's it, I get out, after 6,000 years, get out, that's it. He said, yeah, get out. Right, he said, well, you know, how about some walking money? You know, he's going to be walking. You know? I said, what? What do we owe you for? You know? What do we owe you for? You know? He said, Allah, you know, 6,000 years of prayers, worship. I mean, that's a lot of back bending there. You know? I took a high, broke my back, you know? I mean, here we are, you know, six hours of worship and we are tired of the Qadr. Six hours of worship and we are tired. And here Shaitan worshiping for 6,000 years. And he's saying, Allah, you know, I broke my back and this and that for you. I prayed for you. There has to be something in return for that. You must be worth something. Give me something in return for that. So Allah says, all right. Oh, it's for your worship you did, your prayers. Says, yeah, yeah, it's for my prayers. Okay, okay, okay. So what do you want? My prayers. Allah is giving him an open-ended offer. Really, look at this. Shaitan could have asked for anything. Could have asked for anything. He could have said, okay, if you're giving me a chance, I'm saying astaghfirullah, I ask for forgiveness. You think Allah will say, no, I will not accept it? Allah would accept it. He's giving him a chance. He says, okay, tell me what you want. What do you want? You know, anything, you know, Allah, he could have said, okay, Allah, you know what, I'll do all these bad, but please, I'm asking, since you're asking me for something in return for my ibadah and worship, uh, how about Jannah? I asked for Jannah. Do you think Allah will say, no, I will never give you Jannah? Allah is not stingy like us, you know, for example, who make an offer, you know, if it's too big, we say no. You know, for example, we tell our son, you know, hey, son, it's your birthday, this and that, what do you want? This and anything you ask for is an Xbox, all about that. <laughs> <laughs> what, you think Allah's going to do that? Of course not. If Allah made an offer, whatever Shaitan is going to ask for, he's going to give it to him. Allah is not, for example, going to lose anything if he gives. We, I mean, we can't afford an Xbox, you know. 
You know, so what happens is that this is, you see my friend like said this, Allah made that offer. Shaitan had the choice there. And for what? For his worship. So, you know, at the end, what did Shaitan ask for? He said, Allah, give me a long life. Give me a long life. In exchange for your worship, you want a long life? He said, yes, give me a long life. I want to live long. So I can misguide all these people. I want to live long. Give me time, give me life until the appointed day. Give me a long life. Is that what you want? Life? Yes, I want a long life. You got it. You are one of those who have been given a long life. My friends, that's it. This is the fifth thing we learn from Shaitan. The fifth thing that we learn from his existence. My sons, Shaitan worshipped Allah for 6,000 years. Right? That's 5,950 years more than us. Right? He worshipped Allah that much. And then this, when it came for him to take a compensation for his worship, what did he ask for? He asked for a long life. Allah give me a long life for that. Where? In dunya. In other words, Shaitan's ibadah, he has shown us what his ibadah is. Shaitan also worships. You know, don't think that Shaitan doesn't worship. Shaitan also worships. He knows who Allah is more than you. He knows who Allah is more than you. And you will see in his attributes when I explain it to you. How well he knows Allah. How much ma'rifat he has of Allah. He knows Allah more than you do. And he has worshipped Allah longer than you have. And this shaitan is saying that my ibadat, my worship, understand what that is. I also worship Allah, but my worship is different than the worship of believers. This is the fifth thing we learn from shaitan. What is the difference between shaitan's ibadat and Allah's ibadat? And then moment's ibadat, a believer's ibadat. A believer's worship. What is the difference? Well, the difference is this. When shaitan worship, when shaitan's worship, he wants compensation for his worship, but he wants it in dunya, not in the akhirat. He wants compensation in dunya. A mu'min doesn't want anything in dunya for the worship he's doing. He's expecting everything in the hereafter. This is the worship of a mu'min and the worship You know, I want something here, a long life, more money, bigger house, health, whatever. You see that? This is a compensation for his ibadah. Making dua to Allah for any of these things is alright. You can make dua, but when you make ibadah, when you worship Allah, that worship should not become so cheap that the price of that worship is dubi. That worship should become so cheap that the price of that ibadat becomes dunya. Iman cannot make ibadat so cheap that you're asking for dunya in exchange for your ibadat. The only thing that is worth your ibadat is in the akhirat. That is what is worth. That's why Allah is waiting to give it to you there, the compensation for your worship. Not in the dunya. We don't ask for it here. But you see, Shaitan has taught us well, you know. He has taught us well, you know. We, we you no, know, we, you know, If you don't see it, I see it a lot of times because, you know, we as the Muslims practically live in the masjid, so we know who comes to the masjid and who doesn't, and who's more frequent than others, and why he's becoming more frequent in this and that, you know. And we come to a general conclusion, you know, that, you know, in masjids, you know, where people come and pray this and that, you you find like two groups of people who come there very well, you know. I mean, you'll find, you know, like, and if this are here and here, Alhamdulillah, there's a lot of movement towards Islam for the youngsters. You see a lot of youngsters here. But back home in the Muslim world, you see two groups of people who frequent the masjid. Those two groups are the retired and the unemployed, you know. <laughs> These are the two groups of people you will see in the masjid. You know, if you're in the masjid, then either you're retired or you're unemployed. 
<laughs> you know? And so, you know, whenever anyone he comes to the masjid, you know, obviously ask them, so what are you here for? You know? You know, what are you here for? He says, you know, no, Alhamdulillah, Morana, this, this and that, you know, uh, you know, I feel like I should pray and this and that. No, really, what are you here for? Allah, you know, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, you're looking for a job. Good. What's that? So what? So now you start praying. You pray and pray and pray. And after three, four months, you say, Morana, what can I do? Four months I have prayed, yet no job. <laughs> Brother, are you praying for a job or are you praying for Allah? <laughs> what are you praying for? You know, is it for a job or Allah? I mean, what is this for? Exactly. Who gave him this door? Where did he learn it from? That your prayer should be for a job, your prayer should be for exams or for a wife or something like that. Make dua for these things, that's fine. Make dua, Allah, I need this, I need a job. Allah said, ask me for anything. But when you pray, pray for Allah and have the, have the value of that prayer. Know the value of that prayer. This is why, you see, these things we learn from shaitan. We learn these things from shaitan. Says, shaitan says, here, this is why you should pray. This is shaitan's ibadah, my friends, who makes worship to Allah, who prostrates before Allah, but he wants the price of that ibadah in dunya. But a moment's ibadah is that which he prays here, and he wants the price of that in the akhirat, where truly Allah can recompense you for that. This is a moment's ibadah. But truly, uh, Ahl al-Bayt have shown a different way. I said, still, if you worship Allah, even for Jannah, it is not good. If you worship Allah, even though Jannah, my friends, Jannah is the fair market value of your ibadah. Jannah is the fair market value of your ibadah. If you worship Allah sincerely, then heaven is the fair market value. But it's not the real value. It's not the real value. Jannah also cannot come. He, Jannah also cannot be the price of your ibadah. If you really look at it. And the Bayat have shown us. That's why Imam Ali has said that I don't pray to Allah for the greed of heaven nor for the fear of hell. But I pray to him because he deserves this. <laughs> By not looking at Jannah and Heaven, they pray to Allah and say, No, the true price for your ibadah is Khalik himself. Because Jannah, no matter how good it is, it is still a creation. Heaven, no matter how good it is, it is still a creation. Your price of your worship should be the Creator himself. He should be the price of your worship. Pray for him so that he is pleased with you. My friends, this is what ibadah is for. Shaitan has taught us that ibadah of shaitan is so that you can gain something in dunya. But ibadah of a moment is better than that. It is for the akhirah. This is the fifth thing we learn from shaitan's existence. And I will stop over here. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq and the blessing to be on the right path. Uh, the wisdom to understand his guidance. Hasten the reappearance of Iman. Make us his helper when he comes. Wa tuqdaqana and alhamdulillah and bin ta'ala. Salaam. To be on the right path. First, you must reject shaitan and say no to shaitan and disobey shaitan. Then you have to obey Allah. This is what this is what it means to be on Sirat al-Mustaqim. And Islam, when it came, it came in that first sentence that the Prophet had said, summarized this concept. In one sentence saying, La ilaha illallah. Before you say Allah, you must say La ilaha first. You must say and believe in there is no God before you can accept God. Allah does not accept that faith that does, that does not come through 
who say la ilaha. He does not accept your faith if it's not rejecting the false gods first. You must reject those false gods, then you come over here. This is why we see that all the prophets, when you look at their lives, their whole